This is Anthony Morganti. Welcome to my podcast for the joy of photography. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode 16 of the For the Joy of Photography podcast. You may remember in last week's podcast, I talked about some exercises you could do that could help you with your photography. And included in that conversation was how to reverse engineer an image. And I showed some examples on a website, 500px. And I talked about how you could look at another photographer's work, look at a specific image, and reverse engineer it. See what they did that made that image compelling. Well, I'd like to carry on with that theme in this episode of the podcast. I want to show you some of my fav favorite photographers and explain to you why they're my favorite photographers and maybe some of the techniques and uh, work that these photographers do will help you with your photography or at the very least inspire you. I am going to again be on the website 500px.com. And um, again, as I mentioned last week, I have no affiliation with 500px.com at all. They're not paying me to do this. As a matter of fact, as far as I know, they don't even know who I am. Now, one other thing I want to talk about too is that in the show notes, I'll include links to all of these photographers. So after the podcast, uh, go over to the show notes and you could go over and look at the photographer's work for yourself. Now we're going to start out with landscape photography. And the first photographer is actually a pair of photographers that share a 500px um, with each other. They're Dylan Toe and Marianne Lim. And when you look at their work, the, I think what probably will pop out at you right away is light. And I'd like to make the suggestion that if you look at these images, you'll notice that probably 80 percent or so of the images were done during the golden hour. Those of you that don't know what the golden hour is, there's a couple different explanations or interpretations of what the golden hour is. Uh, the first is it's from sunrise to an hour after sunrise and an hour before sunset to sunset. Another explanation or interpretation of the golden hour is actually a half hour before sunrise to a half hour after sunrise and a half hour before sunset to a half hour after sunset. So those are two kind of explanations of what the golden hour is. Whichever way you slice it, it's just a way to recognize that the best light for landscape images is usually around sunrise or sunset. And it's quite often that I see a photographer kind of complain that their landscape images don't, don't cut it. They just don't have any pop, no punch. And most of the time, it's because they're shooting uh, during the day, during the afternoon hours. They're not shooting during the golden hour. Now, if you look at their work, as I mentioned, you'll see that most of their images are either right around sunrise or right around sunset. And it's really um, fantastic work, I mean, overall. And what I like about them, too, is if you click on an image, like we click on this one, um, you could see that it was a slower shutter speed. Well, they're one of the photographers that will include their camera info and you could see and their exposure info. So you could see they shot this with a Sony Alpha A7R2. They used a Canon EF 16 to 35 millimeter f/4 lens. They shot at 16 millimeters f/11. It was a one second exposure at ISO 50. So they got all this blur uh, by exposing that for one second. So they could give you an idea how to get these kind of long exposure shots. Shots like this where the water is really smoothed out and has that kind of ghostly look to it. Again, it was that same Sony camera, that same Canon lens, um, F11. This was a two-second exposure with an ISO 160. So that really gave that beautiful kind of um, 
to me, ghostly look. And you can see through this, just the light is just unbelievable. And then what I think you should also notice, in the images where it wasn't the golden hour, they really didn't include the sky in many of these shots, but they included a lot of light and shadow. Uh, this image here, I would guess it's probably not the golden hour, but you could see there's a lot of, first of all, there's a lot of green. It is a longer exposure because the water's blurred, but you could see how there's a lot of light and shadow. It kind of adds a lot of visual depth uh, to the image. It looks like I could walk right into this image and walk back into the back cave area there. Um, and it's a very, very, um, to me, beautiful image. And again, the exposure information is there, F11. This was a 30-second exposure. So this is an image that I don't think was probably done during the golden hour, but they just didn't put the sky in the image. And they do that continually on these images that I, I feel probably aren't uh, golden hour images. So that's why I really, really do respect their work. I think they're very good. I mean, very, very good. And, um, you know, I learn a lot just by looking at their 500 PX, um, account. Now, another landscape photographer I'd like to talk about is the photographer, Mark Adamus. That's A-D-A-M-U-S. Now, again, I, I should apologize too. Um, I know a lot of you listen, uh, to the podcast. You're not watching it on YouTube and I'm talking about images. So I apologize and I will try to better describe the images uh, going forward. So it kind of just dawned on me now, so I apologize for that. What I like about Mark's landscape images, well, first of all, the light, of course. Many of his images, I'd say probably, well, more than half of the golden hour. But he's also taking very unique perspectives. There are some that are obvious aerial shots, so he either was in you know, an airplane, a helicopter, or he's using a drone. Um, here, let's... While we're here, let's click on one. Here's an obvious aerial shot. And unfortunately, there's no camera info. And that is an option the photographer has uh, to either include camera and exposure info or not. And unfortunately, at least on that image, Mark didn't. But uh, what I really do like about it is his, his different perspectives and angles. Um, he tends to either be very high shooting down on things or very low shooting up on things. Um, he has a lot of uh, compelling uh, parts of the image in the foreground. Uh, so it's not just from the mid-ground back on a landscape image. Many photographers, when they're doing landscape images, they kind of ignore the foreground. Nothing interesting happens until the mid-ground. And then sometimes the most interesting thing is in the background. Well, with Mark's images, um, you'll see many of them have very interesting things in the foreground and all the way through to the background. And that, again, will add a lot of visual depth to the image. It will look like you could walk right out into the image. And that's what I'm talking about when you have visual depth. So um, very, very intriguing, very beautiful, beautiful photography. And um, I think that that is an account that you could learn a lot just by watching uh, seeing what he does. He has some minimalistic stuff on here, but most of it is just different angles. And I should add too, he doesn't always have his camera perfectly level. Uh, many of us, uh, me included, were very um, adamant about making sure that the horizon is perfectly straight. But there are a few images in here where he has a very uh, compelling view and things are a little tilted, crooked. And um, I think that adds a lot to this shot as well. So check, check out Mark Adamus. Now let's move over to portraiture a little bit. And I love Portraits by Sam. Uh, portraits by Sam. Fantastic portrait photographer. And I think what first really draws me to Sam's images are the eyes of his models. The eyes are just compelling beyond belief. They're just so beautifully rendered. And part of the way he brings out the model's eyes is with catch lights. 
Catch lights, of course, are very, very important, most often very, very important. For instance, I'll click on this image here, and you can see that um, the catch lights in her eyes are just unreal. They just really draw you into the image. Now, another thing he does, he uses very shallow focus very often. And let's see if he used uh, camera. Yeah, he has camera info here. Um, this was a Canon EOS 6D. We're looking, those of you listening, we're looking at a, just a headshot of a young woman. It's a black and white picture. Uh, she has very dark hair. Uh, the background is graduated, um, like a radio graduation with very bright in the middle, radiated out, getting darker as it goes towards the edges. Uh, she has black hair. Um, she has very dark eyes, but um, huge catch lights in the eyes. She has um, rather large um, lips, very beautiful though, and she used the, or he used the uh, Canon EO 60, and I'm uh, assuming Sam is a man. I'm not sure because it could be Samantha. So I apologize if it is. Um, Sam uh, used a Canon EO 6D, a Canon EF 85 millimeter f1.2 lens, and this specific image was shot at 85 mm. Of course, it was a fixed focal length lens at f2, uh, one three twentieth of a second ISO 500. So at f2, you could see we have this very shallow depth of field. So her eyes and her nose and her lips are in focus, but then even back where her hair begins or the back of her eyebrows are, that's out of focus. So very, very shallow focus. And I think that really makes the image very, very compelling. So two things that Sam does so far that I think are really compelling are the catch lights in the eyes. Also the shallow depth of field Sam often incorporates and the third thing is that either the, the images, the face is going to be very evenly lit, so it's very flat light, or Sam uses dappled light on the face. And you can see that it's not just any dappled light. There's, also, there's like designs of light um, on falling on his model's face. And I think that is just incredible, incredible. And another thing on many of the images Sam is using a ring light, and it looks like some type of LED ring light. And you could tell that by when you look at the image, look at the catch light in the model's eyes, and you could tell that it's circular. And in the case that it looks like it may be an LED ring light, it's just kind of the shape of the um, actual light that's, that's making up the ring. And I think that's really, really interesting. Um, and to me, just incredible, just incredible lighting. And usually a ring light, uh, it goes around the lens. So it's a light that circles, you know, ins the, that encircles the lens. So the lens is in the middle. And it will make the light on your model, um, and make the shadows very, very faint. So it's going to be a very kind of flat light. But what it does, it kind of makes your model glow. I know it's kind of hard to envision that maybe if you're not looking at the images I'm looking at but it kind of makes your model glow. And combine that with the shallow depth of field and usually a dark background. So the skin of the model is, is relatively bright, very creamy looking, but the background is usually very dark. And you'll see that um, it really makes the model just pop out. And I just love, love their work. Uh, so. This is um, one that I would suggest you take a look at and look at how they um, just do these subtle things with light, especially um, with the um, dappled light falling on the face of the model. Sometimes the hair, a lot of times um, images, especially portraits, will look very static. But what Sam often does is the hair looks like it's got movement to it. And um, I think that adds... Uh, some kind of a dynamic look to the image. And I think the shallow depth of field will often help with that as well. And even when Sam isn't using um, artificial light, like a ring light or another light, uh, they position their model so that the light from a window is putting catch lights in the model's eyes. And I'm currently looking at a model now, and it's obviously not any added light. It looks like it's light from a series of windows that are above and behind uh, the photographer. So uh, check out 
Portraits by Sam. Now, many of us, I know, we don't, uh, you don't have uh, artificial lights, and you're doing um, most often maybe a lifestyle type of photography or maybe environmental photography. So you're taking images of people outside or maybe in their homes, but you're not really using any, um, any additional lights. You're just using existing light. And one photographer I think that ex excels at this is Ali al Zaidi, And I apologize if I'm mispronouncing uh, Ali al Zaidi's name, a Kuwaiti photographer. Fantastic. Um, just the, the photography is just gorgeous. Most of his models, and this is similar to, to Portraits by Sam, po the, both of them are similar in this regard. Most of their models aren't smiling. If they are smiling, they have a little bit of a Mona Lisa smile. And I, I admit that's subjective. Uh, that I'm drawn to that. I like it. I like portraits better when the model isn't necessarily smiling. And both, um, again, Portraits by Sam and Ali al Zaidi um, are in, similar in that regard. And uh, just beautiful work. Just beautiful, beautiful work. And I would say that probably 80 to 90% of the portraits that Ali has on his 500px are existing light uh, portraits. And you just go through and we could see, let's see if um, we have camera info. Yeah, and this image here of a, a little girl uh, taken in front of a door. You could see that um, it was a Nikon D800E uh, done with a Nikon 20 to 4 to 70 f2.8 lens. It was at 36 millimeters f3.2. So again, shallow depth of field, 1 1 60th of a second ISO 250. And typically with portraiture, you want to try to open up it usually as much as possible. Use shallow depth of field so that your um, kind of separates your subject from the background. Now, there are probably some uh, lifestyle or environmental portraits where you want the background more in focus. And there's an image here of a, a young boy sitting on a tree stump in a field and it's got good depth of field most everything is in focus and in this case Ali used uh, f16 so you got you know more depth of field here so there are some instances where you may want to have the background more in focus uh, there's an image here of um, a man with a beard a turban-ish type it could be their hair, actually. I don't know. And uh, they're holding an iPad and with an unusual look on their face. And the background seems to be pretty much in focus. And this is at F5. So it's got, you know, didn't open up all the way, a little more depth of field here. But then on the other hand, uh, there's a picture of a, a girl and uh, the background is totally blurred out. And this was at F1.4. So you could see that, you know, that really makes her pop off the page and really gives a lot of depth to the image again so um check out ali's uh 500px i think uh he's tr like awesome a really really great photographer now this next photographer is i guess you could call a travel photographer uh it's now i'm gonna totally destroy this name so i'm so sorry gian stefano fontana vaprio okay um they're, they're portraits of people in the street. So, uh, you know, just beautifully done. Now, these uh, people are usually smiling or often smiling, but it's just kind of a blend of street photography, travel photography, and portraiture. And that's why I, li I like the uniqueness of it. And um, it's black and white when nothing of color, in my opinion at least, when nothing of color is interesting in the shot. Um, Gian Stefano chooses to process it in black and white, but when the colors are compelling, he'll uh, process it in color. And you could see that these are just tremendous images. And again, we could click, let's see if Gian Stefano, no, unfortunately, it doesn't look like he included camera info. And again, that is an option of the photographer. Yeah, there's, um, he did not include any exposure info or camera or gear info at all on the shots. But um, I really do enjoy his work, and I think that there's a lot to be gained here. And I mean, most of us 
go somewhere. We go on vacation once in a while, and I think there's a lot of um, stuff you could learn by just looking at his work. Very well done. Now, the next uh, photographer is Georgie Powell's uh, street photography. And um, just a lot, a couple things uh, kind of compel me or grab me about um, Georgie's um, photography. Again, it seems the mo majority of it's black and white. So if there's nothing of compelling color in the shot, Georgie chooses to process it in black and white. On the other hand, the few color images that are here, it's obvious why he processed them in color. The color is what is pretty much making the image. So I think that's pretty interesting. The other thing is um, a lot of different perspectives. There's a lot of times where he's got his camera really low or really high. So he's shooting up at people or he's shooting down on people. And there's a few instances where he has his camera crooked. And it's very um, kind of interesting perspective. And it kind of adds a little more um, uh, visual interest to the shot by shooting up or having people above the camera. Not necessarily always shooting up. He might have people at the top of stairways or vice versa. He'll be at the top of the stairway shooting people at the bottom and things. The third thing that is very compelling, again, is the light. And you could say that probably about any great photographer. They're masters of light. And when you say masters of light, I think what I'll, often you're implying and what isn't being said is your master's a shadow. And a lot of his images, just the shadows are just so interesting, just the way the light is playing against the shadow. And I really like his work. And I think it's um, super interesting. The fourth thing, uh, because it's really considered street photography, uh, most of his work here, uh, the people in the shot. He's usually not just taking a static image of a person. Uh, the, there's something compelling about that person, something that's interesting. They're either running or they're holding an umbrella or they're um, looking not straight ahead. They're looking way up or looking way down or their eyes are closed. Something is compelling about that person in the scene. It's not just, um, you know, an image of a, generally speaking, I mean, there's a few, but not generally an image of a person just walking down the street. I mean, there are some of those, but I, but overall, like I mentioned, I think the, the people in the shot are very interesting as well. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff here to digest and chew on and to think about how you could use this to help you improve your photography as well. Now, the next photographer is a street photographer, um, Carmine Shiriakel. I hope that's right. Um, what, com what really is interesting about uh, Carmine's photography, there's a lot of motion. And the motion isn't necessarily the objects or people moving in the scene, although there are images with that. Sometimes the motion is his camera. He's moving his camera or he's zooming with his lens, zooming in or out while he's taking the picture. And um, a very interesting, very different. Um, they're kind of I, almost city landscapes, but in a very artistic way. So um, some of the images are almost unrecognizable, but they're very compelling because of the way the blur is. So a lot you could uh, learn from, the, uh, from this photographer as well. Unfortunately, on most of the shots, I had checked this earlier, there's no uh, camera info. Uh, you know, it would be nice. So if you join 500px, if you'd like to do other people favors, I would say include your camera and exposure info, your gear and exposure info, because it really does help get an idea how some of these images might have been captured if we know what the exposure info was. So that's a, a really um, compelling photographer, Carmine. Check him out. Now the next photographer is a street photographer and um, again, master of light. A uh, lot of the images of this photographer, I should say, is Luis P. Goncalves. Okay, I know I'm destroying these names. I apologize. Luis is work um, again, master of light. And a lot of the images are seem to be more at twilight. Not all of them, but many of them. 
at nighttime or twilight or when it's what we often called when I played baseball, dusk dark. It was hard to see a baseball when it was dusk dark out. There were, you know, before the sun was below the horizon and before the lights of the baseball stadium kicked in full, you know, full brightness, we called it dusk dark. And a lot of his images are like that. Also, uh, perspectives. He has a lot of images where he, he has the camera like right on the street, like very low to the ground. Others that where it's rather high. Um, so lots of lines in his images too. Lots of diagonal lines, leading lines. Um, and there's payoffs. When you're looking at the diagonal line, as you're le it's leading you through the image, you'll see a person uh, somewhere along that path makes it interesting. I mean, leading lines, diagonal lines, those are all great. But many times people incorporate those in the image, but there's no payoff. You're encouraging the viewer to look at that line and follow it through the image, and there's nothing there that's interesting. So use leading lines, but have a payoff, have something interesting. You're looking at a leading line, it's going through the image, and it, it, the payoff is it kind of terminates on a person. So you see a person there. Leading lines, often coming from the corner. Uh, usually if you could get your leading line coming in from a diagonal, it is even more compelling than, an Im than a leading line like from the middle of the image. Or a meandering line is very interesting too. It helps bring your viewer through the image. Uh, but um, what I like about his photography, uh, Luis, it's like got these lines that go through the image. Um, also, most of it's in black and white, and I think, again, he does some in color, when color really adds to the shot. If there's graffiti and the graffiti is very colorful, then he has that image processed in color. Otherwise, if there's nothing interesting in color, he doesn't bother doing it. A lot of um, depth to his images, too, where I have people in the foreground, people in the background, um, which adds, again, visual depth uh, to the shot. But really, I think you could, uh, two things main that I take away from his work is the perspective, often getting very, very low, sometimes very high, but also the lines, the way he's leading us through the image with these leading lines. Um, very, very well done. I really do like Luis' work. Now, next is a photographer that's just different. Um, I don't know what you would call this. A lot of this is city photography. Well, it is like all of it's city photography, pictures of buildings and such, but a lot of symmetry, a lot of asymmetry, and a lot of color. Uh, very compelling use of, uh, in some cases, complementary colors, in other cases, just, you know, pastel looking colors. But overall, the main thing is just the symmetry of the shots. Um, really, um, and by the way, this is, uh, Eric Dufour, 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 D-U-F-U, sorry, D-U-F-O-U-R, Eric Dufour, um, incredible work. And really Eric had to train his eye to see these things because a lot of us maybe wouldn't notice it. And I think a lot of times what is very compelling about some of this kind of so-called symmetry shots is when something appears to be uh, perfectly symmetrical. Let me see. Um, <clears throat> but there's something in the frame that kind of throws off the symmetry. And I think that really makes the shot that much more interesting. Just, you know, all the symmetry. And then in this case, I'm looking at the side of a building that has these just perfectly rectangular lines, you know, making lines that are making these rectangles and these uh, fainter lines that are making kind of a triangle or diamond pattern, but there's a window open, so it throws off the symmetry. So that really, I think, makes uh, the image that much more compelling. There's another image here. It looks like the side of a building and it has these perfect, like, uh, kind of siding that is colored in such a way that it looks like steps. And it's mirrored in the middle. So there's a left side and right side that almost look identical with like a porthole painting in the middle that is right in the middle, which makes that look very, uh, you know, symmetrical. But there's a shadow of what looks like a street lamp throwing off the symmetry. And I think that uh, makes that image more compelling. So 
I really like looking at his work. I like to see the symmetry. I like to see, try to think of how I could see this when I'm out taking uh, pictures. Camera info is included. In this image we're looking at now of this very colorful building, and it looks like it has like mirrored um, parts of the building under and above windows where you could see um, kind of uh, the scene behind the camera. Or this could be a mural that's just broken up by the windows, and that's probably what it is. But it was shot with a Canon EOS 5D Mark II with a Canon 70 to 200 millimeter f4 lens. It was at 87 millimeters f10. 1 one sixtieth of a second, ISO 200. Um, very interesting, very compelling, a very different uh, photographer, and that's why I kind of like looking at Eric's work. Finally, the last photographer I want to talk about is a macro photographer, Oliver Wright. Um, most of the macro images are of insects. Uh, some are birds, but mostly insects. And if, you know, you don't like insects, you may not like his work. But, I mean, this is like tremendous, tremendous photography. Uh, just so well done. Camera info is included. A Canon EOS 5D S. Canon EF 100mm f2.8 macro lens. 100mm f4, 130th of a second, ISO 800. When you look at the images, what I often do, especially with macro, because... Um, usually the depth of field is so shallow with macro and a lot of times the, um, you could use the depth of field to your advantage to kind of highlight, let's say a praying mantis's eyes where everything behind the eyes are, are pretty much out of focus, or you need to be careful of the depth of field if you want more of the insect in focus, or in the case we're looking at a fly that looks like it's got, um, dew all over it. So it was probably a cold day and the fly isn't very active and so obviously um, Oliver was able to get up close to the fly and take the shot without it flying off but it was shot broadside so that we're looking at most of the fly and it's all pretty much in focus um, beyond the fly though is totally out of focus just you know very uh, very pastel-y and milky looking so it uh, really makes the fly jump out so that's what I like doing, uh, looking at like the f-stops. And you can see the angles. Uh, there's a shot of a uh, bird, and it's really just broadside of the head, the side of the head. So everything you're looking at is in focus as far as the bird is concerned. But the depth of field was probably not very deep. Just beyond the bird, it's totally, totally out of focus. But it, if this bird was turned slightly towards the camera or even slightly away from the camera, then either, you know, some part of that bird would be out of focus. And, you know, that's what I see a lot of macro photographers um, kind of miss out on. I see a lot of, in the spring especially, I'll see a lot of pictures of dragonflies, and they're not shot on the broad side. They're shot like kind of semi-crooked, so that maybe the head's in focus, but the, the uh, abdomen is out of focus. And it doesn't always look right. So, you know, um, especially macro, try to shoot broadside if you can. Um, if you are going to use shallow depth of field, use it to your advantage. In this case, we're looking at an image of either a damselfly or dragonfly. It looks like a dragonfly. And it's shot like right nose on, like it's a portrait. And you could see, you know, the, the nose and mouth and eyes and antenna are in focus, but... Um, anything beyond that, behind that plane, is out of focus. So it's a very compelling image. And again, try to shoot broadside uh, so that you're shooting um, you know, as much as of the insect or bird or whatever your, your macro subject is, is in focus. And if you are going to have part of it out of focus, try to do it in a compelling way. Usually you could do that by shooting like nose on, like right straight on. Not have it slightly crooked, like right looking at the nose of the insect or bird. And I think that makes for a very, very compelling shot. So these are some photographers that I really admire. Again, in the show notes, I'll have links to the 500px uh, websites of these photographers. You could check them out. Um, if you're, you know, some photographers you like, put it uh, in the... In the um, in the uh, comments of 
any photographers that you like and their website and wherever it is, 500px or wherever. If you just want to give yourself a plug that you'd like people to look at your work, put it in the description below a link. Um, if it's YouTube, YouTube might not publish it if it's a link, but um, you know, give it a shot. You never know. Um, again, I'd like to thank everyone that uh, watches um, the podcast. I really do appreciate it. That's it for this week. I'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for watching my podcast for the joy of photography. Remember, stop by my website, onlinephotographytraining.com. There you'll find all my latest videos and articles to help you improve your photography. That's it for now. I'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you.